thank you to those of you who have joined us live here on this session already and those of you who are watching this as a recording today. It's my pleasure to invite you all to take a seat with us at the boardroom table, exploring the challenges that organizations face of governance in a world of climate change. I'm Jack Keyes, Chair of the IFAMA Young Board, and I'll be facilitating our panel today. Today is the first episode of a new IFAMA podcast series. For those who aren't already familiar with IFAMA, the International Food and Agribusiness Management Association, IFAMA is a membership organization that brings together the world's leading scholars and students, industry and NGO professionals, and policymakers to improve the strategic focus, transparency, sustainability, and responsiveness of the food and agribusiness system. This is the first of several podcasts which we're going to be hosting, and we're fortunate to be joined by three global thought leaders from around the world in each session, exploring some of the most important and impactful topics facing food and agriculture today. To get things underway, it's my pleasure to first introduce our panelists. Firstly, we have Damien McLaughlin, a professor at UCD Michael Smurfett Graduate Business School in Ireland, specializing in agribusiness strategy and business to business marketing in both his teaching and research on half a dozen leading MBA programs, over 70 published papers, and a vast range of academic and industry experience, specifically advising several Fortune 100 food and agribusinesses. We also have Mary Shellman, who uh, is known as Agribusiness Royalty, the former head of Harvard's school's agribusiness program. Mary is an internationally recognized thought leader and strategic pathfinder for global agribusinesses and is a frequent keynote speaker at leading global food and ag conferences. And we have Juan, the group head of sustainability and food technology ventures at the Kerry Group. Currently based in Madrid, Juan is known as a transformational executive leader in strategic and sustainability transformations, driving revenue growth and triple bottom line turnaround. And the topic for today's session is the emerging role of corporate governance in leading the battle against a growing climate crisis. We now have wide acknowledgement from international agencies such as the UN, and alongside governments and businesses from across most of the world, that recognize climate change is not only coming in the future, but it's already upon us. Current forecasts are expecting the planet to see a 2.1 degree temperature rise with consequences for food production, the environment and communities being severe. So today we're gonna to ask our panel to discuss policy some corporate governance, technologies and international collaborations from the perspective of leading food and agribusiness organizations. With that background and those introductions, I'd like to get started with our discussion and we're gonna jump straight into it. So I'll fire the first question to you, Damien. Corporate governance is challenging with such complicated climate and ESG questions that are being thrown at us. How does this affect the skills and experiences that someone needs to develop to be a successful and impactful board member? Thanks, uh, thanks, Jack, and thanks for the invitation to to, to be here today. It's a, it's a real privilege to be involved with anything with IFAMA, but to be involved with the the young board is, I have to say, a particular privilege. I really appreciate it. And it's nice to see you personally again. Um, skills of, of board members, I I think it's a it's a you know if we when we think about corporate governance, often what we think about firstly is the regulations of of corporate governance, and in my direct experience of of programs that were running at our own school and and with other organizations the vast majority of senior leaders um are surprised when they understand uh, or when it's explained to them the coming regulatory environment uh for sustainability obviously that for me primarily applies in Europe but also in the United States most senior leaders just don't understand uh what's 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 coming down the down the tracks so I think the obligation on board members to make themselves aware, I think, is 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 really significant. The second thing is that I I think a lot of um, you know board members, and, and this is a real downside, particularly in our industry. Um, while some companies make a valiant effort to get uh, kind of even gender equality on boards, the vast majority of boards, particularly in in private companies, are are still uh, you know pale male and stale, and and they tend to be older men, and so the the enthusiasm that 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 particular demographic has for the environment as an issue 
uh, is low and they largely discount that topic. One of the things which, you know, the larger companies and the leading companies that I've, I've, I've been involved with in this area have done is to connect sustainability with, with uh, uh, finance. So if you can, if you can get the finance people of the organization on board and, and create a series of financial metrics around sustainability, suddenly now it becomes a board issue because most board members are, you know, they have some financial literacy, regardless of what their 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 the reason why they're on the board might be. But if 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 you have this ability uh, to connect your sustainability environment, the legal environment that you face, the environment that your industry faces. Uh, but also the impact that it has on your organization in financial terms, I think that's really significant. There's, there's, there is absolutely no doubt, and this is why sustainability broadly or ESG, whatever we care to call it, is so exciting, is because it is going to have an impact on capital allocation. And I think one of the board's primary responsibilities is to think about how we allocate the capital of the organization. So in the past, we've done it based on, you know, you know, managing, you know, replacing old projects and, and allocating new projects. And now we need to carve out as board members, you need to carve out issues around how does how does ESG, how does sustainability impact on 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 our capital allocation? Um, I think there's two other things which I'd really like to emphasize. And I, I read a tremendous book by Lawrence Friedman recently about it's called it's called command it's a military history book and lawrence is a retired professor and brilliant scholar um and it's a wonderful series of essays and uh in those essays he in one of the essays he talks about like what is it that is great about uh, great generals and um you know we you know napoleon said he wants to have lucky generals but what professor friedman says is generals need to understand the whole field of battle and I thought it was exactly the same for board members and sustainability. The thing about sustainability is that it started out with something about water or waste or something like that, and then it kind of moved on to carbon, and and now it's on methane. But it's really only the it's really only we're really only at the start of this. And so, what board members need to do is to make themselves aware of what the entire battlefield looks like, and it's and it shouldn't be a battle, but it is. The entire battlefield of sustainability looks like over. The next ten or fifteen years, whatever the you know the next two or three planning cycles of the organization uh, might be, um, in order to do that, I think board members need to make themselves aware in the broadest sense of sustainability, and frankly, and with some honesty, um, I think there's a general resistance towards uh, towards doing that. Um, so two other little things, uh, two other one little thing, one big thing. Um, I'm kind of less concerned about sustainability than I was uh, 10 years ago. Not, I don't mean about climate change. Obviously, the impacts of that are really very significant. But the big four accounting firms, it seems to me, have basically packaged the manage of, management of sustainability. Um, and obviously, if they've done it, you know, the lower down firms have, have done it as well. So I think um, to rely on your external partners, your audit partners, they have packages now in terms of the management of risk, the management of transition, the creation of plans. I think it's a tremendous idea for board members and aspiring board members to do. Um, final final thing for me, Jack, on this. Um, I, I have a colleague and a, and a friend, uh, Gautam Chalagala, who's a professor at, at IMD in Switzerland. I believe him to be the only professor in the world who has effectively thought through the implications of sustainability for increasing revenues and increasing prices um, of uh, of products. Um, and he's written a really nice paper in Harvard Business Review, and he has another paper forthcoming in the next issue of Harvard Business Review on this topic. The idea that we have to reallocate capital towards sustainability, maybe we prefer to spend that on 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 new plant and fittings or a new acquisition, that's, that's one thing. But the idea that we have to take lower margins or lower prices in exchange for sustainability is an idea from, from 30 years ago. It's a, it's a silly idea. And I think what Gautam lays out very effectively is that if you focus on the customer and you continue to provide the customer with the benefits that she or he wants, there's no reason why you have to you have to charge a lower price or achieve a lower margin for uh, for sustainability. So I think a new skill set is required uh, for, for, for board members, Jack. 
uh, this is a rapidly changing environment. There is a responsibility, particularly on non-executive directors, uh, to make themselves aware uh, of this. And uh, we have a program at our school that does this. Um, but so do many of our so do many of our other partners, and um, it's not difficult, uh, but it is essential. Thank you very much, Damien. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but you have something uh, in common with both dancers and gym classes, and that's when you say two more or one more points, there's always a couple extra that are going to come in at the end, and they're always the ones that hit the hardest. (laughs) But thank you very much. We've covered a lot of different um, aspects of that question, and I think it flows in really well to the rest of the conversation. So thank you for setting the scene for us. And those that have joined us live in the session, please feel welcome to use the chat function if you want to add comments, um, uh, interact and engage with our panelists and and begin a conversation there as well. Um, we will be able to see that as the conversation unfolds. But Damien, you spoke a bit about the diversity in skills and the importance of that around uh, the allocation of capital and the prioritization of understanding this whole field. And that leads in really well to the question I wanted to ask you, Juan, on uh, how do you think that business leaders should be making this balance of ESG reporting and the priorities of climate change uh, with corporate profitability? Thanks, Jack, and thanks uh, for your, uh... managing us today in the conversation and for uh, Farmer to invite us. It's a pleasure to be with my uh, fellow panelists here. So I want to build on what Damien said. I, I, I don't think it's a choice or It's not uh, sustainability or profitability. That's a very old idea. Maybe old in the sense that it's 20 years old, but uh, I think it's not really a choice nowadays. Sustainability ESG has become a requirement. It's driven by the expectations of majority of stakeholders. You you look at investors, customers, consumers, regulators more lately, and then society at large. And so I think leading companies uh, refer to what Damien said, and I agree. And I will read the professor with interest because I, I like to put uh, to see some numbers on what I know it to be true for more than 20 years already I've been in this field. Is that If you look at profitability, uh, at sustainability as an investment, profitability goes up. And the companies that look at that as an investment are winning and earning a positive return on that. And I can give you some data points, uh, which are, from different places, right? Risk reduction in supply chains, right? So sustainable, more resilient supply chains uh, give you more resilience to price variations and shocks. Efficiency in operations. Basically, if you can operate with less energy, less waste, less water, less raw materials, you're making more money. It's a it's a productivity play. And uh, smart operations become sustainable operations and becomes profitable operations very fast circular products with less waste. So if your R&D people are able to reduce, reuse and repurpose, this is all less cost, so it's more profit. So either for your own uh, or for downstream in the value chain or upstream by uh, using um, uh, good smart building blocks that might be uh, our, your waste is my product, right? And some industries have discovered that a long time ago, that waste is not waste. It's just a, a product to be used. It's a byproduct to be used, up, upcycled, right? Then the people side, as Damien will know in his job and, and certainly Mary as well, is if you want to attract good talent, top talent, <laughs> you're either sustainable or you don't, you don't have a chance to compete. Mm-hmm. And if you want to retain them, it's the same, right? So it's not only uh, what you say, it's what you do day to day, right? You will be judged, judged by your values and behaviors by top talent. Um, and then last but not least, if you look at the competitive advantage from embedding sustainability into your commercial value propositions and new business dr- models that drive market share and create value from the positive impact you're delivering to consumers, you will be winning. And um, McKinsey and Nielsen published a study in North America last year, I believe, that clearly shows over a five-year cycle that products that had an ESG or sustainability claim on pack were growing much faster at retail. Uh, And that was not by a little bit. It was very significant. 
And um, obviously, you need to fine tune the claims, good marketing, uh, tailored to different consumers buy different things. But in general, uh, they are buying products that are more nutritious, healthier, have a lower impact on the climate, have a lower waste uh, impact, are based on uh, good uh, agricultural practices, et cetera, et cetera. Right? And so they were buying more volumes of these products at higher value. So all of, all of that delivers increased shareholder value. For investors, right? And so it's a virtuous circle. And it's not even, is, is the jury out there on that? No, it isn't. You know, when uh, the, the, the only jury out there is companies that haven't realized that yet and are not in that virtuous circle. And they might lo be losing without knowing it. Now, that data also, a little bit on the, under the McKinsey, the New York University that uh, Damien mentioned uh, as a Stern Institute, as a Sustainability Market Share Index, where you, you look under and they, they, they really track all the Nielsen data. They did a few additional analyses that shows that uh, in these same last five years, consumers buying more, uh, one product out of six, 15% of these retail products captured more than half of the growth. Again, because wow. of they had sustainability claims. But what's interesting is they came a lot from smaller brands I would call them millennial brands or even lower, non-millennial, younger, uh, <laughs> maybe uh, gens that were marketed digitally in a very in innovative way, but had a positive impact. Right? And so it shows that the, the segments of the population that are spending their money uh, are, are spending their money on sustainability. Thank you very much, Juan. I'm a bit disappointed by that last comment. If millennium brands or millennial brands aren't trendy anymore, uh, I've already missed my opportunity being the, the millennial on the call and I'm going to have to be replaced yeah. uh, by the sounds I'm, of it. I'm, regu I'm regularly uh, in front of my kids, 22 and 24, and uh, I've learned what the meaning of a, being a boomer is. Ah, <laughs> not okay. the meaning, but the consequences of not always understanding what's going on. So I suggest you recycle yourself very fast, Jack. <laughs> it sounds like it. It sounds like it. <laughs> and thank you very much for all of those contributions because you've been able to take us from uh, the benefits of risk reduction and um, the resilience that sustainability investment provides through to um, some of the more I guess, potentially obvious outcomes of less waste and increased um, efficiency, but also important points like attracting and retaining talent or just aligning with discerning consumers who are the ones purchasing our products. And seeing as we've gone through a lot of these elements around um, why climate change is important, Mary, it's going to be great to have uh, yourself an opportunity to add to this conversation, though um, there might be be some agreement there might be some disagreement we've already um, covered off a few of those points it, it's interesting regulation is uh, just seem to be being used to address cl the climate crisis um, as quite a popular government tool across many jurisdictions and that's initiatives like um, the task force for climate related disclosures and other legal requirements but I'd, I'd probably ask you the same question. Why should those in governance positions around the world care about climate change outside of those legal requirements? Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Well, thanks, Jack. It's uh, great to be here. And it's always good to um, to support FM and be in conversations like this with uh, my good friends, Damien and Juan. Um, I, I will say they, they both did an amazing job, right, in answering your question and uh, making it sound like this is a, just a no brainer, right? And it's a, but I would also offer as an American perspective on here, a bit of a European view of, of sustainability. I think we all recognize that, um, you know, maybe countries, companies, individuals are in different places in their sustainability journey. Uh, in, you know, I look at this and absolutely, you know, the, the arguments that one laid out very Thinkly about you know increased resilience, efficiency, the uh, you know the the abilities to you know the attraction of talent, the um, the competitive advantage piece, 
are, um, you know, those are all very attractive. But I think, you know, conversations in, you know, the some boardrooms now, we see a little bit more pushback in the U.S. against um, these issues that might be, you know, fall under an ESG heading. And particularly the risk of um, being, you know, considered that, you know, if you disclose that you're um, maybe, you know, talking about greenwashing, is it really possible to produce products that are carbon neutral? Um, you know, it's, um, is it a, you know, a viable strategy to think by having, imposing regulations to, to, to try to, again, you know, move companies along on this pathway, does that put you as an industry in a less competitive position going forward? So I think the, these types of, you know, even, you know, bigger conversations around that at the end of the day, you know, our industry makes, you know, the food that people eat, they make fuel, fuel that um, and fiber. Um, but of all of those, arguably, you know, kind of the food is the most important piece. And I think, you know, we don't live in a time, it's, it, this isn't alchemy, right? We can't actually get something from nothing. So we must invest resources, natural resources, in order to have an outcome. And that, um, you know, that has to do with, you know, a societal good. Um, you know, when I look at this, I think, you know, conversations in the boardroom um, need to be or are, again, in the U.S., you know, you think about the, you know, the, again, navigating this fine line between continuing to, you know, to, to push ahead on doing more with less. And as an engineer, I'm very, very keen on the fact that, you know, um, you know, we need to have the data, we need to have systems in place, we need to look for alignments, we need to be able to do everything we can in terms of a journey of continuous improvement. But I think the, um, you know, kind of this overall target right now that seems to be, you know, have risen so much around, particularly on the carbon side, that, you know, we're going to be carbon neutral by 2050, which many, many have adopted, you know, the question is, is really, is that really, you know, realistic? And, you know, I think, you know, good boards are have should be having those tough, tough conversations, as opposed to just kind of falling in line with what happens to be the sentiment of, of um, you know, today, because as Damien mentioned, you know, sustainability, the, the whole concept is evolve, evolving. Um, when I first, you know, started talking about this, thinking about this, you know, back in 2010, which was already a little bit late, but some 12 or 14 years ago, question was, is, you know, what are we talking about when we say it's sustainable? Are we talking about, you know, from the food system standpoint, is it, you know, kind of, you know, is it sustainable farming, sustainable agriculture, a sustainable food, a sustainable food system? And um, as you kind of move up that chain, I think you start, um, you know, there's two pieces of it that we have a hard time dealing with. One is at the consumer side, which is, you know, making choices every day about, you know, what they were doing and how as a, as a company, you know, your choices are actually making their actions more or less sustainable. I hold, heard Paul Pullman talk um, several years ago now, probably, you know, 10 years ago, Unilever, of course, has been, you know, a leading um, force in terms of this movement around the world. But he was giving a presentation at Harvard Business School, and he was talking about everything that they were doing inside Brazil to make their shampoo products more sustainable. But yet, I stepped back and thought, well, wait a minute, is, you know, how does that actually square up with their marketing message, which was you need to basically, you know, shampoo your hair every day. And if they truly wanted to have a more sustainable world, the message, the marketing message should be consume less, you know, by, by not consume ours. So, um, you know, I think it's, you know, that's one piece of it. Uh, you know, that, again, th those are tough, tough decisions as you um, board should be wrestling with to think about how they are actually, um, you know, coming up with this piece. And again, a little bit past your regulations. I think the, you know, the, the questions around sustainability as we think about it now, you know, the thing that's always been the most challenging to me is um, potentially the loss of a license to operate as an industry. 
and we see what's happening right now in Europe, um, you know, particularly with, you know, farming, different types of farming operations, whether you're in Denmark, you know, raising pork or whether you're in um, the Netherlands with some kinds of, you know, animal protection sectors or maybe even greenhouses or Ireland where there's, you know, kind of pushback against the, the dairy industry. The dairy industry is a, a very efficient producer in Ireland from a carbon standpoint. Um, and because of that, you know, have been able to, to grow their industry, to grow share. Um, but now with this target of carbon reductions that the, that the country has is legally binding for, really the only way to meet that requirement is by actually, um, you know, reducing a herd size potentially. And, you know, we're reducing a volume output and stopping growth. And so the other area I think that, you know, when we think about this is, you know, how does this um, the area of, you know, kind of sustainability far from regulation, you know, is how does it impact the growth mandate? It's easy to meet targets by cutting off that arm, right? If you have something that is potentially performing less than something else, then, um, you know, you just get rid of that and then your average goes up or your, you know, or in this case it goes down, right? So if, as a company, you know, if it, you have a growth mandate and I think that's, uh, if you don't have a growth mandate, then basically you're in hospice as a company um, or as a, as a series of countries like maybe Europe is, if, you know, if you don't have that growth mandate, you know, how can you actually square up this, you know, yes, we are getting bigger, we are taking things, but that at the same time means our carbon footprint is also bigger. So that's a, you know, kind of a communication issue and really this grappling about, you know, what does sustainability actually mean? So check out Pentagon a little bit off of your I, question. I, 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 I want to pick up on that if I can for a moment. Okay. I, I, th I think the, um, you know, America is such a, I mean, it's the greatest country on earth, in my opinion. I'd love to spend time there, except, I mean, our industry there is so dynamic, but I think it's important not to get distra distracted by the chitter chatter around sustainability that happens in the United States, particularly in our industry. Agriculture in in, in the United States is so industrialized that its capacity to change to a sustainable model very quickly in comparison to Europe, where farming is so fragmented, there's no com or Brazil, where it's no comparison between the two. There's just it's it's unfair to compare that. I think what's really, really, really important for board members, Jack, which was your initial initial brief on this to be clear on, is that by 2050, Europe will meet its carbon targets by hook or by crook. That will happen. One of the consequences of that is that the agricultural supply base will be smaller. Our job is to protect that supply base. We cannot have, you know, right now Paris is blockaded by farmers with 14 or 16 bales of hay. Hi, they're, they're, they're blockading uh, the entry of food into Paris. And our farmers in Ireland and in other European countries are, are having similar uh, kind of protests and support of their colleagues in, in France uh, and, in, and in Germany. It is really important that we protect our supply base and we do not allow farm families to be to consider themselves to be criminals or to be to be negative contributors or negative externalities, as an economist might call them, in uh, to the global community. One CEO said to me that the European Union is really clear on what its targets are for 2050. It just doesn't know what the consequences of that might actually be. So, if I and ha in my advice to to the, the boards that I'm on and that I've worked with is, let we have to assume in 2050 that we will achieve our carbon targets. If the union has not worked out what the implications of those targets are, then it's up to us to work out what that is. One of them for me, the most the most important one right now is to protect the supply base. Um, but uh, I think it's I think clarity is important for uh, for board members and the kind of dialoguing around this that's that's taken place, particularly in the United States, I, I don't think is helpful to the uh, to the rest of us. Um, one of our colleagues. Um, at Harvard, uh, Jose Alvarez, Mary, and you know this, you know this case for the case last year about Marfrig's transition uh, to sustainable beef production. And um, I've taught the case many times. It's a fine, it's a fine case study. But uh, when I taught it to CEOs of the beef industry, they said, you know what the case doesn't say, and what you need to know as an instructor 
is that the entire Brazilian beef industry has engaged in this effort. It's not just Marfrig. Marfrig is a firm I admire tremendously. But that is a tremendous, they have all done it because they recognize the need, not just for Brazil to deliver on, on, on sustainability, but for them to manage their international markets, uh, that they have to do, they have to do the same thing. And I might just say, and this would be a real one more thing, because I wrote down a whole bunch of things, as always I do when Mary talked, but this is a real one more thing. The founder of IFAM and and the cur the person who influenced so many of us uh, around agribusiness, Ray Goldberg, said that uh, the food industry is a public good, and anybody who's involved in the food business, actually, you know, board members should write that in the wall of the boardroom. Our industry is a public good, and right now the food industry is being asked to recognise its contribution to global warming, while at the same time recognising. Uh, the contribution that the carbon it produces makes also to healthy, uh, to healthy, to healthy. Looks like public, we... it's a public good. It is not. Um, it's not about the market in the way that other industries are. Yeah, thank you very much, Damien. We just lost you for a few seconds in the middle there, but I think we still we got, got the essence of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah we got that. And um, yeah, thank you very much. I think Mary, it was really helpful to hear you uh, calling out some of those difficult tensions that exist around this topic beyond just the really obvious ones. Um, calling can I, out the. Can I say one thing back yeah, to, to Damien do. because yeah, it yeah. because I can't let it go because he just like piddled away the the U.S. conversations that are happening <laughs> by saying that we're all very industrialized here, so we can you know change on a dime. I would say that is not the case at you know at the farm level, and so that's the the you know the biggest struggle right now is actually to um, to communicate what happens down on that level. But I will say though that you know by going down, and then he also said the most important thing we need to to do in Europe is, is pr protect our supply base. Um, I will say though, by, by layering on regulations, it makes it, it can tend to have an impact on an industry that increases the requirements for scale. So basically the big firms win, the big farms win because they're able to handle the cost of these regulations in a way that smaller entities can't do. And I think that is, kind of opposite the vision that consumers have in their mind that, you know, we like these family farms, we like the, the countryside that has, you know, these, these lovely smaller enterprises, you know, we like, you know, this romantic notion. And so I'd be very interested to hear kind of how one would see that piece of it, you know, sitting at the corporate level and uh, with a company like Kerry. Yeah, absolutely, Mary. I was just thinking it'd be great to have one uh, weigh in on this one too. So over to you, Juan. If you've got anything you'd like to contribute, yeah, I think that the answer is is complex. So I'll, I'll try to have a good go at it. First, I think uh, sometimes when politics mix with physics, that's where we have a problem. So I'll, I'll follow the data rather than the opinions, right? So I think science is a good is a good guide for us at Kerry. So we have created the programs at the farm uh, in Derry, in Ireland, and we are incentivizing farmers to adopt regenerative agricultural practices. And, and as you know, uh, Damien and Mary, the, the average size of a farm in, in Ireland, if I'm not wrong, is around 100, 120, about the herd size for dairy. But what we found is that the most the, the farms that have the lowest carbon footprint use the less the less fertilizers have the lowest footprint on nitrates in the water um, are the most profitable. It's very interesting. Again, what what was true for a large corporation is true for a farmer as well. So I'm not always sure. I don't have the well, for, for all the data to prove that scale is always the answer. I, I don't think so. I think it's more of a mindset of making sure that when you produce, you are considering this as a holistic system. And I am, uh, I am an economist, right? So I do agree with uh, Damien that food is a public good. It has positive externalities. Food is life afterwards, but it has negative externalities. Food is responsible for one third, food and agriculture, one third of all the emissions. 70% of deforestation, 70% of water usage. 
So it has both rights and responsibilities, right? Or duties and responsibilities. And, and, and I think the debate here is what's the right balance? So if I look at uh, the food industry opportunities, right? First risks, let's say. When you do, you mentioned TCFD, right? When a corporation that is in the food act, food value chain looks at where the key risks are, a lot of them are driven by potential climate shocks or climate change in agriculture. So climate can drive uh, problems in farming, driving uh, issues with food security, food resilience, and price shocks. And it's not in 2050, it's now. Okay, it's happening as we speak. <laughs> we're sitting on certain commodities. We're sitting on very short stocks globally. And so as soon as there is a, a problem, the price starts spiking, right? And the, it's very interesting when you talk to the traders that uh, the ADM, Cargill, Cargill Olam, or, or Bungie, who are our suppliers, that, that they will explain that to you in a very compelling way. But the, the prices will go up and down and the supply chains will be disrupted. So corporations right now are investing in regenerative agriculture. You look at some of the big food companies, very large ones. I won't name them here. They can speak for themselves, but they're investing collectively billions into regenerative agriculture. Why? Because the current system, which is not regenerative, you can use another word, whatever you want to call it, is not resilient. And having soil preservation, biodiversity does provide uh, resilience to climate shock and consequences, which is weather, water usage, diseases, supply chain disruptions and prices. So that's one way to look at it. And so when you're largest uh, snack producer in the world and your key commodity is potatoes, you are investing hundreds of millions of dollars of, in Iowa. Same for oil. When you're in dairy like Kerry, you are investing significant amount of money with a payback in dairy. And we now have in Ireland, one of the lowest carbon footprint per liter of milk, scientifically measured by a third party. And large corps are starting to queue up to buy that milk at the premium. So it's very interesting where countries will lose market share in commodities, not based on price and quality, based on carbon and water and nitrates in water and other aspects. And these discussions transactionally are starting to happen. Mm. I, I just add one, Damien, one thing to, yeah, just add one thing to, uh, to Juan's comment again, it's a supportive comment in the, on, on this occasion is, I think what we've seen is the fragmentation of commodity supply in recent years. And many of the people on, on this call, my family members and, and so on, are um you know very entrepreneurial have started their own trading uh businesses um just talking to my friends in the in the abcds there's a very definite move back away from that fragmentation towards those larger companies because of the guarantees that they can provide in the supply chain and one reason for that is because of of climate change so the idea that you could buy it off a small operator somewhere you know because it's the same grains it actually doesn't really apply in the same way anymore because the level of uncertainty in major firms, the major firms which supply consumer brands is so great, they don't want to take a chance in a small entrepreneurial firm in, in Ireland or in the Philippines or in Bangladesh or wherever it might be. They want to deal with the big guys uh, who've got the who've got the power and the muscle uh, to deliver in this. And it's a... It's a it's, it's both, just Damien. I, I don't chain, want to yeah. argue, but it, it's both. Huh? You will see the big guys are also investing in local supply chains closer to the source. Consumers want to buy local. So it's a balance. It depends on the yeah. commodities. It's both, yeah. actually. It's both, but I think they're I think they're parallel to each other because I, you know, I see yes. what some firms have done in Africa. You know, if you want to invest in Africa, you have to absorb the cost of taking on the, the hard institutional investment to make that happen. Um, and so, you know, some of the firms, Mary and I did some work with a firm in Africa and, and this, call, again, not, not to mention the company's name, they're not present today, I don't think. But what they said was, we never wanted to be an agribusiness, but in order to do business in Africa, we had to be an agribusiness. And so I think you're, again, not, 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 not disagreeing, and we probably should disagree a bit more, 
But I think it, these are all costs which reduce your overall margin, but are essential in order to deliver a sustainable future uh, for the whole planet. Thanks, Damien, and all of you for being able to build off that question so well. Uh, I think right at the start, we moved away from this concept of, is it profitability versus um, environment? But we have stumbled into this uh, alternative tension, which is growth versus being able to balance regeneration and how we affect systems change in a rapid way. Um, because though we know that some of the solutions are there and often uh, the same solutions that benefit the environment or climate change or sustainability do benefit uh, profitability and can even um, benefit growth but there is a transition period too so I'm quite interested to come back to you Damien but also hear uh, the others opinions on is there any elements or levers that could be pulled in the boardroom to help to increase the urgency to help increase that speed of transition um, for helping to support against climate change mitigation and i'll also open you to challenge anyone in the audience here as well keeping them engaged what what should the audience um, be considering and please keep some of those comments coming through in the chat um, those of you who are with us live and if you're just listening um, you're welcome to be yelling at your car or wherever else you're listening to this and arguing alongside damien and juan and as they're going back and forth too <laughs> but over to you first damien um maybe i'll deal with the people who are who are on the call um first because i mean they're most important people in this in this movement because the people on this call if younger i family members perhaps jack i know not everybody might fall into that category but the younger i family members will be the ceos in 15 years time when this thing is at its absolute peak and um i have never ever met a ceo or a chair uh, or a senior leader who was not interested in new ideas. So if if you are, if you're a younger person, if you're learning something or you have a view, I would not be afraid um, to to reason it out and write two paragraphs and send it to your equivalent of of Juan and and say, look, I here's what I'm here's what I'm seeing. It's what I'm learning from my fam. It's what I'm learning from courses. So I'm learning from other uh, from from other companies. Um, I think that's a really important thing to do um, for a younger person. It's a great way to get promoted, um, um, but it's also a, it's a great way to uh, to have an influence and to have an impact. I, in terms of influencing uh, boards, I, the only way you can influence a board is is through the finances. Jack, really, at the end of the day, that's it. And the, and there's there's the direct impact on on finances in the sense of, you know, if we're not allowed to produce beef, um, or we're not allowed, which is not not a that's not a wild idea. You know, Alltech and and our friend Mark Lines has produced a new documentary. Is what if what if there are no cows? It's on in the trailer of it on LinkedIn. I'll try and find it and put it into the chat if I can. Um, but it's not a it's not a wild idea. It's a bad idea, but it's not a wild idea. And um, I think I think a board has to think about those kinds of risks. What if we lose this license to operate? Uh, what if we are are regulated, not so much out of existence, but what if you know the impact that it would have on the the economics of the beef industry if the European Union were to decide, you know, or the Chinese government were to decide, or the Indian government is that no public institution would serve meat on on Mondays and Fridays. You know, it's a forty percent reduction in public institution consumption. I mean, it might sound crazy, but again, it's this it's this kind of uh, think through. I think the other thing is, I, I think what boards need to do today is to stop thinking about mitigation per se, and then also how you handle the consequences. Because, um, you know, can we reverse climate change? I don't think so. It's underway right now. I don't think there's any disagreement uh, about that. But what you've got to think about is what if we what if we can't produce spring lettuce in Spain anymore because it's too cold? Uh, what if we can't produce uh, beef in Ireland anymore because it's too wet? And um, so where do we move that? Uh, where do we move that production to? And how do we manage our business going forward uh, from there? So those are the kinds of things. The board is always about finance and it's always about the long term. And those are the two channels. Uh, that I would uh, try and uh, try and channel those influence effects through Jack. 
Yeah, I'd I'd like to add Mary's perspective on that too. I just would like to give an example of what Damien said is uh, in, at, at Kerry, right? We looked at our uh, sustainability uh, strategy, sustainability strategy five years back, and, and we looked at a number of things. And one area we looked at is the, the food and beverage industry uh, produces 30% waste. So 30% of food is never, uh, never consumed and is lost in different places in the value chain, in developed markets is its distribution, restaurants and in the fridge, in emerging markets in Africa is in the value chain. Uh, but that 30% is 1 trillion uh, euros opportunity. UK GDP is 3 trillion, so that gives you a size. And 10% of all greenhouse gas emissions are associated to food waste. So if you think, okay, using energy and producing greenhouse gas to produce food, okay, you could say ethically, you can explain it. But emitting greenhouse gases to landfill it, it's totally non-ethical, right? So Kerry said, okay, what, what can we do there? And so in the in the last four years, we've turned the portfolio and we've invested into food preservation and shelf life extension because giving more time to retailers to sell the products, restaurants to sell the food they prepare and consumers to consume it, with non-chemical solutions, with healthier solutions than currently exist is a massive opportunity. And the board was really enthusiastic. So back to the board, right? The board has a strategic play to support corporations that create value. And in this case, reducing food waste was one major externality that we have technology and science to improve. And it's not only the preservation, it's the science of microbiology. How do you maximize food safety? So food that is healthy doesn't kill you when you eat it. Food uh, shelf life, so it lasts longer. It doesn't have chemicals, so no health effects, no, no nasty chemicals. And you minimize packaging. And this is a very complex science, right? So doing that and becoming the largest company in that field is something that Kerry has done in the last five years, right? And so that's a massive strategic play on MNA, driven by a sustainable nutrition strategy, fully supported by the board. Thanks, Juan. And it's brilliant to be able to hear those examples and, and really valuable to have you in the room to be able to speak to them. Um, Mary, interested if you've got other comments on anything that Damien and Juan have said or just uh, other thoughts around that urgency. I, you know, again, as I, uh, you know, great points around that. I guess, you know, one piece of it that stand, two pieces that stand out to me. Um, and one piece is, you know, Juan talked about the companies right now that were, you know, investing in regenerative farming as that idea. And when I was talking before, I said that there were kind of two pieces that we talked to, that we talked about that, that didn't come through sometimes. You know, I, I, you know, I talked about the consumer side and how their decisions were. This is the second piece of it that I was going to say that I didn't was on the farming side, because I think, you yeah. know, the being able to, um, you know, encourage change, I won't say drive change, but encourage change at that level is clearly where, you know, the biggest opportunities are, because again, you know, 70 to 90% of the impact of, of all of these products are at that level. Um, you know, two pieces around that, you know, one is that farmers are, um, constantly being asked to share their data and if data is valuable. One, you have to collect the data so you can actually know, you know, one talked about the, the work in Ireland and finding out those smaller dairy farms, you know, could be, you know, as efficient um, or even more efficient than larger farms. You have to have the data to know that. So, uh, but to be, to be asked to collect data and share data without being um, paid for that is a mistake in this system. Um, just as the idea that we should ask farmers to be making changes with, for this public good of food and for the public goods of the ecosystem services that they provide without being compensated for that level of ecosystem services, improvements um, that are available. So one, you know, we need to find these systems. And again, I think this is a, you know, it's a strategic conversation because what it's saying is that you might have to actually pay more for your raw material 
um, along the supply chain. And again, this kind of, you know, can get you into an area of cost competitiveness and hit the finances um, without that, you know, that very long-term view there. Um, so that's, that's one, you know, piece of this. Um, I had a second piece, and of course I forgot it right now. The second piece of it was around, I think that, you know, as we talk about, you know, the, the conversations, the type of skills um, that individuals should have, and even more broadly, the type of skills now that it takes to solve some of these very challenges, problems, want to discuss them and to get even beyond the lens of, you know, just looking at it from finance, but to get your head, head around it. But then, you know, thinking about the, um, the solutions that can come up is the role of technology and particularly right now, I think around, um, you know, AI this ability to look at an optimization problem on a much larger scale than we've ever been able to do before. It's a complex, complex system. Um, it's, you know, maybe we can't actually, you know, model it all the way back to the crop growing on the farm, but to be able to run operations in um, a much more efficient way is, you know, it's highly possible. And as Juan said, you know, kind of the carry example about identifying an opportunity and saying, you know, how can we tackle this? And so I think there, there's a role now, this need to bring in these multidisciplinary approaches. Um, and, you know, Damien says the board, it always comes down to finance. You know, I, I argue strongly that the, it's the individual sitting in the chairs in the room, in that boardroom, and they, again, need to appreciate that that the way that we go about finding solutions today and in the future, it's different than it has been in the past. And so it needs to either have individuals in the room that, you know, can, can bring in, can help guide that, um, that group of people there, or it's at least a board that needs to be open enough to realize that they need to be bringing in experts from the outside in order to, break this mold that tomorrow will always be the same as yesterday. And um, so kind of, you know, a, again, a different set of skills, you know, Damien talked about, you know, write up answers for me. It's like, you know, being able to, to, to widen that perspective around it. And if I had advice for, you know, our younger members that are listening in, you know, um, broaden yourself as, as much as possible. I'm an engineer, but you know, ended up spending my career in uh, food and ag with some, you know, kind of throwing in some business and economics training along the way. Um, but, you know, I think the the diversity of backgrounds and our ability to communicate and to actual to, you know, to come up with a vision of a future that we want, as opposed to one that's being forced on us is tremendously important. There's a lot of powerful comments you've added in there, Mary. I want to thank you for bringing the farmers into the conversation as they rightly deserve to be, but also, of course, the, at almost in some ways, the other end of the spectrum um, when we're considering them, um, that rapid emergence of AI and how um, being really prepared and well-versed in technology is going to open up opportunities for optimization and solving some of these large problems we're already heading into the last few minutes of this conversation so i'd like to get right around the room once more if we can and i'm going to open this up uh, to each of you uh, firstly if you've got any other top tips you'd like to add to the young people that are joining the session um, in terms of if they're interested in joining their first board or starting their governance career what might you say to them and don't tell them to run the other way <laughs> but i'm sure you wouldn't and also, if you've got any other final comments that you want to leave with us, just in general, from um, being involved in the conversation so far, um, we'll go to you first, Damien, and then come around to you, Juan, and then Mary. Uh, I think being a board member is really tough, and I'd advise you to run the other way. Uh, <laughs> I think people like the idea of the prestige of it, and and sometimes the money if it's for a, a for-profit board, uh, but it's really hard work. And if particularly, I think if you've been an executive, if you're an academic, you're used to having no influence and having to cajole people along to do things. But I couldn't imagine, you know, if you're an executive, particularly a senior executive, as, as Juan and, and Mary have both been, to then switch to a non-executive position where you can't tell people what to do. It's got to be really, really hard. Um, I think pick up some uh, governance qualifications as quickly as you possibly can. 
Um, and there's lots of stuff you can do online. Uh, I've done a nice program on, online at IMD and save the expensive stuff uh, until maybe a bit later in your in your career. The best board directors um, have a full view of the field, as I said, as at the start, so you try and, and develop those broad skills. Um, and then I think I, I, I think there's two other things. One is to join relevant uh, not-for-profit boards. That doesn't mean the board of your local school and stuff. That that's, that's valuable for other reasons. But if you want to be on the board of agribusiness companies, try and do things which are related uh, to the field and build and build specific expertise. Boards are usually combinations of people with different expertise. And right now, everybody wants to have people with expertise in AI, for example. Uh, sustainability is kind of taken as a given. So if I was if I was a young person trying to start out, I'd be building some AI uh, expertise. And then in, in uh, don't try too hard because I think in our industry so small, it's so easy to get a reputation as sort of pitching yourself around the place for board members. And I, I don't. I think you know the best board members are the ones who don't want to be board members, uh, because they take the responsibility seriously. And and good luck with it. It's 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 fun, but it's not what you think it's going to be. It's a lot harder, and it's a lot more worrying. But it's uh, of course it's worthwhile if that's where your contribution is. Thanks, Damien. We'll pass over to you, Juan. Uh, well, Damien did an excellent job as usual. Um, if I may add a couple of things, and I think it's um, curiosity. Uh, a good good board member is a lifelong learner. He has curiosity to learn what is going around the world. He has the capacity to understand both the risks and the opportunities, and he has the capacity to turn that into quantified quantified. Um, financial terms at least doesn't have to be an accountant to do that but he understands what risk means in terms of quantification of the risks right but it's not only the tangible risks it's the intangibles and intangibles have a nature to turn into tangibles very very quickly today's risks become tomorrow liabilities and after tomorrow <laughs> balance sheet issues very quickly so understanding that is is important so a strong some strong financial background will help you a lot. And I think David mentioned that. And what we've done in Kerry, just to give you an idea on how much finance and sustainability are the two sides of the same coin, is that everything which has to do with our non-financial disclosure, which is sustainability, is managed by finance. Okay, so I repeat that. <laughs> our treasurer or <laughs> controller are now um, most <laughs> advanced sustainability experts in the company. Okay, and so we are growing accountants turning themselves into sustainability experts because they they deal with sustainability disclosure with the exact same discipline or try to do that with the exact same discipline as financial disclosure. Now it's a marathon. We're all learning, and we have a tsunami of regulations coming to to us. We haven't talked about that, so there is a steep learning curve with the. Uh, CSRD and EFRS, etc. I just throw the acronyms out there and I will not tell you what it is because if you want to become a good board member, you need to know what these acronyms mean. Start learning. <laughs> Unfortunately, our profession is full of those. Thanks, Juan. Great last uh, challenge for the young people on the call there. Um, with our last bit of time, Mary, I'll pass over to you for the last word before I, I close us out. Sure, of course, and, uh, and so I'll be quick in the, the interest of there. I would say that, you know, my biggest piece of advice, you know, in addition to these very, very good pieces is to get outside your industry. Um, and it's, you know, we get so focused in our own industry, you go to conferences in your industry, you have, nobody has better understanding there. But the more you can get outside of your industry, uh, Damien and I often teach in programs to where uh, folks come in and they say, well, there's no case here about our industry. It's like, yeah, that's the whole value of it because it's what's going on in under industries that you can really learn from. And, um, and, and so whether it's your, you know, if you're in, you know, animal protein, you know, go learn about crops, or if you're in agribusiness, go learn about what's happening in, in energy or something else. And of course, then I have to give, you know, from my perspective as being a former president of FAMA, um, the, a plug for our organization because I think that's uh, the way that we approach this is not again, you know, is that is at that kind of global level 
across industries, across you know regions, across pieces of the value chain, and being able to to think about it from the perspective of these different stakeholders. And I think that's tremendously valuable and um, something that you know everyone should be taking advantage of. So Thank you, Mary. Appreciate that. And I guess, wow, that's been a lot of ground covered in the last hour. But as you mentioned, I think all of you, there's other topics we could have delved even deeper in and continued the conversation. So, um, yeah, that is a good plug for iPharma. If you're wanting to be around these conversations, um, continuing on um, having these challenging topics and opportunities for further discussions, make sure you are involved uh, following iPharma on LinkedIn, on YouTube, and signing up to our newsletter. Um, the links are going to be sent to everyone who's registered for the podcast. But uh, I want to close this up quickly because we have run out of time and just say a massive thank you on behalf of um, all of us at iPharma, the Young Board and the audience today to our three panelists for giving their time and their fantastic insight and what a great start to our iPharma podcast series. Um, for those of you listening, uh, just a reminder to look out for our next session as, long, as well as the upcoming iPharma World Conference, which is to be hosted in Almeria in Spain for 2024 with the topic Achieving Food Security Through Innovation and Sustainability. Very relevant for today's conversation. Uh, but that's all from us today. Thank you again, and I'll look forward to reconnecting with you all soon. Take care. Thanks, Jack. See you, Mary. See you, Juan. See you. Thank you, Thanks, everybody. everybody. Jack, Mary, Damien. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you, everyone.